So it's a, a pleasure to be here, to be able to talk and <clears throat> participate in this symposium. So I have a little bit different perspective to offer. Is that too loud? Okay. Uh, because I, I wasn't a student with Larry, although I was awe, in awe of Larry since I was a beginning graduate student. I wasn't a long-term colleague with Larry, but I had this amazing opportunity to get a job at the University of Washington. Don't tell any of my biology colleagues, but actually Department of Genetics was my dream job. So I got kind of close, so. <clears throat> and I want to thank the Department of Genetics and Genome Sciences for allowing me to have an adjunct appointment in genetics, because it's really one of my most important academic um, uh, connections of all. So uh, as I said, I had an opportunity to um, interact with Larry over the course of two years. I arrived in, in 85, and he died in 87. And this is my favorite picture of Larry, because this looks like Larry when I first met him. And I won't go through the uh, amazing, imp all the amazing impacts that you already have heard a lot about, but just uh, remember how broad and deep Larry's legacies are and why we feel so privileged to have inherited um, some of the things he started in this, in genome, in genome science at the University of Washington. Um, all of you have heard from Stan and others about how, what a great colleague Larry was and how he impacted. And I, I always tell people when graduate students would interview that this department, as the Department of Genetics, trains students as a department, not as a lab specific duty, but as a department. And that to me is, I think, really unusual and with high standards. Teaching and training, um, you all know about that. I'll tell you a little bit about my connection with Larry for genetics and why he's so important to our research community. So Mitzi, here it is. So this is um, the pedigree that was published in 1996, so we have to update it a little bit. But this is the Morgan lineage, and I don't know how, if you know how close we are to Morgan in this very room. And so here, if you just look at some of the names, there's Thomas Hunt Morgan, and then his first generation of students, Sturdivant, Bridges, Muller, Stern, Dobzhansky, Beadle. And then you can recognize some of these names, and we'll elaborate. We just have a couple, 23 years or something to add on to this. But um, the, our guy of the hour is right here, Larry Sandler. He was the third generation. He was trained by Ed Novitsky. And Larry um, became this master chromosome mechanics because of um, Ed. Now, Larry got his PhD with Ed, but he's not the only famous person that got a degree from Ed. Here comes another one down the aisle, and that's Iris Sandler. And here's a picture of Iris. <laughs> now, now, Iris. You gave it to me, remember? <laughs> when we were looking for pictures. Huh? So here's beautiful Iris and handsome Larry getting their degrees, a master's degree and a PhD. Isn't this great? Yeah. The same year from, uh, from Missouri. And then also very important in this lineage, for me personally, um, is Dan Lindsley, who said he went to go train with Sturdivant. This is what he told me, but Sturdivant wasn't that interested that he was there. So he actually trained with Novitsky and considered his training as a geneticist with Novitsky and Larry, who they made a lifelong friendship, as you know, to be his most important training. Now I'm gonna expand this region, so see if I got it right, all of these who know things. So here's my update, as far as I can tell. Uh, I've connected you, Charles, to Novitsky from Oregon, and then here's some of your speakers here. Here's your meeting organizer connected to Gall as well. Ginger Zegge, this is very impressive, right? Here's some other names. See, see Mitzi, this is that pedigree you're looking for. Uh, Ralph with Jeff Hall, right? Leo with Ganetsky, Danny with, pardon me, I spelled who wrong? Did I spell you wrong? Oh, oh no, I didn't do that. That came with the current biology, yeah. And then I got my degree with Tom Kaufman and just was in awe of Larry and all, Herschel Roman and other people, and Charles Laird. And I came here, applied for a job, and said I was going to work on heterochromatin. And they didn't, like, throw up 
They didn't tell me I was crazy. They didn't tell me to go back to homeotics or chorion genes. They actually said, oh, interesting. So I thought, this could be the place for me. This was the group of students that was working in Larry's lab when I arrived. Kent Golick, Bill Sullivan, who are here. John Tomkill, who as far as I know isn't here. Glenn, who's here. He's at Seattle, a professor at Seattle News. And our friend, uh, Sergio Pimpinelli, who worked with Larry for a long time. Um, his collaborator in Italy. Okay, so here's the pedigree. Now what I want to tell you about is the kinds of things that I learned from Larry when I first arrived. And I think this is right. You can tell me if it's true. I think Larry was very much in the Sturdivant and Novitsky tradition where it was derived as much as possible from breeding experiments. He cared deeply about the genotype. He cared deeply about the phenotype. But as far as I can tell, he didn't really care about the messy stuff in the black box. Yeah, Iris is nodding her head. And this was to me kind of, well, I like genetics a lot, but I just spent a postdoc learning molecular biology from Alan Spradley, so shouldn't I use that? So this was what I remember hearing from someone, I don't know if it was who it was, the fly is a way for chromosomes to get from one generation to the next. I think that's how Larry figured it out. He was more interested in the chromosomes as organelles. This is his tools. This is a lot of what the lab had. I think they had other sophisticated experiments like some fly collector hanging on the wall or something like that. And if well, you walked into that office that was adjacent to Stan's, it was a skinny little office in there. Remember that? He had this chair, you sat next to Larry. He had this yellow pad and lots of sharpened pencils. And he would draw crosses, elegant crosses, or make you draw things out for him. That was kind of his mode. And he would, I would hope he would rip those papers off so I could steal them and take them with me. These were Larry's scientific themes. You've seen some of them covered. Um, but he was very interested in chromosome behavior, the outcomes of misbehavior of chromosomes. And sometimes he totally screwed up chromosomes so he could get them to misbehave. He's very interested in the distortion of segregation ratios beyond the expected. And the idea, of course, one of the things he's famous for is um, meiotic drive. Genetic re regulation of meiosis, I bet we'll hear something about that from Scott, the genetics of genetics, as they call it. And this is the stuff that I interacted with Larry, which is the heterochromatin euchromatin interactions. So this is the, why we work on Drosophila. I think most of you know this, because look at this beautiful karyotype. Sex chromosomes, autosomes, right? And then when I first drew this out for Larry, because I wanted to tell him about rearrangements and these genes I was interested in that resided in heterochromatin, but you moved them out of heterochromatin and they didn't function anymore. So I drew the chromosome exactly like I was taught on that yellow piece of paper. And he decided I must have, he gave me a gold star because I actually grew the heterochromatin, drew the heterochromatin in there in the right proportions on the right side of the centromere. Then he said to me, do you want an adjunct appointment in genetics? And I said, <laughs> yes. So that was a very good day. He called, he literally called Walt Fangman on the phone. And I think Walt said, yes, things were easier back then. And I got an appointment. So that's my little star for uh, being here at the right time. And then I told Larry I was going to clone these genes that I think, because you could EMS mutagenize them and knock them out, I think they're single copy sequences. I'm going to molecular clone them. He said, well, I like your idea about working on heterochromatin, but really, cloning? <laughs> and he said, like Barry mentioned, there's only really two genes, he said, that are worth cloning, in his opinion. OK, one of them was this thing called SD, which Kent Golick and other people were working on at the time. And this is a euchromatic locus that when it interacts with heterochromatic elements, called the enhancer of SD, a responder. It results in the unequal recovery of the two homologs of chromosome 2. So do you notice that this is called SD, segregation disorder. This is called enhancer of SD, big S, big D. And this is, the complex is the segregation disorder chromosome, big S, big D. So I had a conversation with Larry that I swear lasted many, many long minutes where he would say, SD, big S, little d, versus the chromosome, big S, big D, the enhancer of big S, big D. And I remember just thinking, 
It was so Larry because it was always quick off the tongue and I'm like, my head is spinning. And then Kent, I think, was picking up even more modifiers, so I thought, oh no, this is going to get worse. <laughs> but he decided that this was one of the genes that a actually deserved to be cloned, so Barry did it. Good job, Barry. <laughs> and then he was working on this other system, Bill Sullivan and John Tompkill, for a euchromatic gene, a maternal effect called abnormal oocyte, or ABO. It, worked, it interacts with heterochromatin, heterochromatin, euchromatin interaction again. And guess what these guys called it? They called it Big Abel. <laughs> on the X, on the Y, two of them and on two R. And so then the next conversation goes, Little Abel versus Big Abel, Big Abel, Y Abel. But Larry was so quick with the um, speech, it wasn't a problem. But I remember, we got to do better on this on the nomenclature. But he also thought the second gene that should be cloned, the only, only second one, was Abel. And that actually was accomplished after John Tom Kale moved to our lab and we worked with Sergio Pimpinelli. Turned out really interesting. It's a transcription factor, ne negative regulator of histones, which is why it interacts with heterochromatin. So that, I hope he would be proud of that, that the two genes that he thought were really only two that worth cloning were actually done by his offspring. So I worked on heterochromatin for a long time. Um, oh, I wanted to say something about Larry and community. So you all know his impact within the department. But those of us who work on fly labs, Larry organized us into fly club. This is a little younger than I remember him, but it's so typical of Larry and fly club. Right, Margaret and Charles, you might remember. We met once a week and talked about something having to do with Drosophila. And Charles would always find an opportunity with a twinkle in his eye to say to Larry, I wonder how that chromosome segregates. Larry, could you show us? <laughs> Didn't you? And then he would draw one of these on the board, and we would get a free lesson from Larry. So those were once a week. Those were really fun. And I knew um, it would come up at some point in time. So our labs were few. I think he would be proud to know that Fly Club continues now with over a dozen labs. And sometimes someone even comes across the state of Washington to attend our fly club. So there's, we don't meet as often, but there's about a dozen labs now. And also, what he did for the Drosophila community was really huge at the meetings. We organized a meeting once. It was kind of a circus, but all of us organized a meeting together. And after, right after Larry died in February, Scott, Barry, and a couple of other people got together at the National Drosophila meeting, and we set up the Larry Sandler Award. So every year at the national meeting, some graduate student with the be judge to have the best dissertation gets a, a lectureship and a free um, trip, I think, for the national meeting. So that's a way to keep his memory alive at a national level. It's a real honor to get that in our community. So Larry was always, of course, um, leading those sorts of efforts, too. So I want to just tell you a little bit about my journey, a short, I hope it's a pretty short story about how I studied heterochromatic genes for, for quite a long time. And then I decided, and mainly because of my contacts with people in Larry's lab, to expand our efforts to study paternal effect mutants, okay? And then male, male sterile mutants that affected fertilization. Lots of people have studied spermatogenesis, but not these types, in spite of all these years working on Drosophila. There were two influential papers that we were using as tools in 87 to 90, and these were the years right after Larry died, where Gerald and I, um, this is our privileged inheritance, we adopted his students, there were three at the time, um, Glenn Yatsuda, John Tomkeel, and, and Roy Cutler. So they came into our labs. John was using, here's a Bruce Baker reference, was using a tool called PAL to cause loss of a heterochromatic element to see its effect on ABO. Okay, this is work that Bill had started and John was continuing. So this is the mutant PAL. It's the only paper published on it. Bruce had decided it was a my male meiotic mutant, very rare, causing paternal chromosome loss because it screwed up meiosis was the idea, so paternal chromosomes in the embryo were defective. So John was using PAL, and then one of Gerald's students, uh, Bruce Edgar, was using this mutant called KD1, male sterile that had been discovered by Fuyama out in the wilds in Japan. Males that carried this mutation actually produced embryos that were haploids because they lost the paternal genome during early development. So these were clearly, these two guys sitting next to each other down the hall in Kincaid, 
we're using these tools for completely different purposes. And Gerald and I sat down one day and we said, hmm, we think the tools are actually more interesting than the experiment. So we wrote a grant, we got a grant, and we started working uh, on paternal effect mutants. They're very rare, they're not very common, so I spent many a summer screening for new and new paternal effect mutations, looking for paternal chromosome loss. Then I went on sabbatical at UCSD, and I saw these trays of mutagenized flies walking across me every day because Charles Zucker had started a screen for behavior mutants. So I just took those, screened them for male sterile mutants, and then and fertilization and paternal effects and was able to accomplish the largest male sterile screen for mutants and paternal feet that's ever been reported. Then a very wonderful guy who just used to have coffee with me every day asked me right before I was leaving back to Seattle if I wanted help with the screen. That was Dan. It's like, where were you all year? But Dan decided he could come out of retirement and he could help me with the screen. For the next few years, we finished the screen. We wrote a couple papers together with other colleagues. It was a really productive and fun interaction. So what Dan and I did was we got and characterized these thousands of male sterile mutants. We gave all of these away to our friends. And then I kept the ones that were fertilization defective. And there was enough there to last me. I haven't finished characterizing them. Um, but I think we've learned some interesting things about them. I'm going to tell you what we learned. What we found out is that for the mutants that we had enough genetics, we could classify them into four classes, uh, ones that affected spermate interactions early, one affected the very first few minutes after the sperm gets in. I won't talk about these, but I'll just tell you they're involved in acrosome biogenesis and acrosome function. And of course, we picked up PAL, several new mutations, that uh, Bruce's gene. We now know it's a paternal effect mutation. It is not a male meiotic mutation. We also picked up alleles of K81. We found a new gene that we called deadbeat, another one called loser, and this one is a German word for loser. We get to do this in the fly world. So we've actually cloned all of these in blue, and they're all encoding male-specific proteins expressed solely in spermatogenesis. There's just one exception here that's involved in vesicular trafficking. It's still very interesting, but I'm going to tell you what we learned from these two mutants. So I have to go back to tell you a little bit about spermiogenesis, and I'm going to use the mouse because the mouse system kind of misled us and lots of people in our field, so I'm, I'm sort of mad at the mouse. <laughs> but what the mouse does is, like all mammals and flies and animals, make sperm by transforming this normal round spermatid to a highly um, morphogenic, swimming, beautiful, mature sperm with a highly condensed nucleus, a flagella, no cytoplasm, okay? That's like stripped off, interestingly, most all of its histones, except about 10%. It puts on transition proteins that facilitate this process, then those disappear, and then it puts on these sperm-specific proteins called protamine 1 and 2. These are the same proteins that Bob Braun used to study when he was at the, in the University of Washington. Um, department, and these are sperm nuclear basic proteins, sperm nuclear highly basic amino acids. We just call them SMBPs. So this is the textbook example of how it's supposed to work. And what you see if you take DNA binding proteins from sperm, salmon, vertebrates, um, lots of vertebrates and mammals, you only get these two little tiny little proteins, low molecular weight. If you, and these are different from the somatic histones. That's how we know most of those are gone. But other animals get a more complex profile of sperm proteins. Nonetheless, because it's a mammal, it's predominant in the research or vertebrates. So here's what just uh, the idea about where do these proteins come from. They're small and they're basic. But Juan Alcio did beautiful stuff comparing different kinds of organisms, and he found that this protamine is related to a protein that looks like this. He called this one protamine-like. This is a, a wing helix domain. With more analysis, he found out that this is derived from the histone linker H1. So the evolutionary origin, according to Juan and his very good data, the evolutionary origin of these SMBPs is from histones, histone H1, and their role is thought to be involved in compaction. And that's what people think SMBPs do. So what does a little fly do? Well, it has the same dramatic transformation here, loses most of its histones, acquires SMBPs, and in the literature for the last 
25 years, these have been called, um, they weren't isolated biochemically just by the nature of their transcripts. They were called the Drosophila protamines or protamine-like and they were proposed to have functions and origins similar to the protamine one and two of mammals, namely histone derived. You look at them, they basically have a lot of basic amino acids. What did we learn from KD1 and Debbie? So let me tell you what we know about KD1. Remember that was picked up by Fuyama as a male sterile paternal effect mutant, one allele in the wild. Glenn in our lab, in working with Glenn, um, Gerald and I, found out, did genetics on it, found it, that's the only thing it does, it's a strict paternal effect, and he actually cloned the gene. It had an amino acid sequence. We didn't know what to make of it. But he also said, you know, I remember that day, he said, there's a paralog. Well, we didn't know what the paralog did either. And then a student um, from Kent Golick's lab, Yi Kong Wang, who is now on his own as NIH, had cloned this gene called hip hop and found that it was a protein in the telomere capping complex. Then he and Benjamin Lopin at the same time, because I knew because they got requests for mutants the same week, <laughs> discovered that KD1 is a paralog of hip hop that's expressed only in spermatogenesis, so it substitutes for that telomere protein, which is really interesting. You can see it in meiosis. This is the ends of the chromosomes. Here are the telomeres that are clustered in these spermatids, and it's retained in sperm. Right? So all cells have a telomere capping complex, but flies melanogaster substitutes one component, KD1, for hip hop, and that's how you keep the telomeres on during spermiogenesis. So the, the telomere capping complex is retained during this whole time you remodel the bulk of the genome. That telomere is retained. Males lacking KD1 produce sperm that lack telomeres, and then what happens is these can fertilize eggs, these uh, sperm with what we call sticky naked telomeres, but the paternal chromosomes are defective. They fuse, they bridge, they break. It's, it's a disaster. They're trying to lose the paternal chromosomes without the telomeres. That's beautiful work by Benjamin and E. Kong. And then these um, guys in my lab actually looked at deadbeat, and Karen Fitch said, gosh, the paternal effect looks a lot like KD1. So Taku and Glenn jumped on it, and they cloned it, and they found it's a sperm nuclear basic protein that localizes to the telomeres in spermatids and sperm. When they do a co-localization with the telomere capping complex, any protein in there, including K81, you can see deadbeat and, and these, the telomere capping complex, localize completely, okay? So this is, as far as we know, we said, oh, maybe it's part of the capping complex. That wasn't true. Turns out the TCC is already there on spermatids. Then deadbeat comes. It requires this to be there to localize to the telomere. In the absence of dead meat, dead meat, no, deadbeat, <laughs> deadbeat, the telomere capping complex, where it's there, no deadbeat, which comes later, then it's lost during that chromatin remodeling event. So we kind of consider it a staple at the telomere to, to keep that telomere capping complex on there. You have to do that during spermiogenesis. Okay, so the, t the conclusion is the telomere capping complex requires active maintenance on the telomere during the histone to SMB transition. It's probably true also of the centromere in spermatids. You just protect those so you don't strip them off and remodel them. That, but what happens after fertilization? So Taku did some really hard embryology, um, but he did a really nice job where you have to look at the first few minutes of fertilization where the male and the female pronuclei come in and then they set up pronuclear apposition and the first embryonic cycle and then the first anaphase. This happens in less than 15 minutes, so we collected lots of eggs really fast. And he looked at the cytology. So if you look at this, this is just normal wild type normally. If you look at the DNA, it's in there with the microtubules and the centrosome at anaphase, okay, both paternal and maternal. But if your dad is deadbeat, this is what happens. The maternal chromosomes will actually go, but the paternal chromosomes are having problems, okay? They just don't want to let go of each other. They don't want to head to the pole. And sometimes you lose the whole thing and you just get a haploid embryo that we call gynogenetic. It's just moms. And then that haploid little nucleus goes on its merry way and it can make a haploid embryo that fails late in, in embryogenesis. So there's normal and there's 
the deadbeat. And chromosome fours went ahead and went over, but you got this mess because of chromosome fusion. Okay? So most embryos, it turns out, even if it has these bridges, which we think is pretty interesting, they'll go through cycle one, they'll go through cycle two, but they're go th in, they enter cycle three and they go, nope, I'm not going anywhere. So there's some sort of checkpoint, we think, that monitors telomeres at, at cycle three. Not one, not two, but three. But if you end up in some spindle losing enough paternal chromosomes, then you can go past that block. That arrest is check two dependent, because if we do, made them times moms that don't have check two, they'll keep going through multiple cycles. They'll just keep ripping their chromosomes apart. So what we did then is we went, this is our model. I won't go through a lot of the details of the time, only that we actually propose a telomere checkpoint at the first division, because in the absence of telomere caps, you can actually delay onset of anaphase in the first division. So that's the earliest, as far as we know, of some delay. It took a lot of embryos to do that. But again, later on, if you have the aberrant paternal chromosomes, you can go on, but then you normally arrest at three, okay? So this tells us that the embryos must know when and how to detect telomeres during the earliest cycles and either wait to try to see if they can repair them or do something or actually go on and then they try to destroy or I shouldn't say that, but the paternal chromosomes get lost. Okay, so we went ahead and cloned the deadbeat gene and it is a small nuclear basic protein and then it's a member of a gene family. Even though I can mutate it, I can cause a paternal effect. It's related to lots of other proteins. So in Melanogaster, there's 13 different genes that are related to deadbeat here by having the similar DNA binding region. And I'm lining up all the DNA binding regions here. It turns out, looking at those DNA binding genes, these are related to HMG proteins, you know, those proteins that have a horrible name based on the high mobility group on the, on the gels. They are normally serve as transcription factors that's probably the most, or, or architectural proteins they cause, but they're very conserved, most of them, across the genome. Well, flies have taken advantage of this DNA binding domain, and they conserve that, but if you look at all the members of the MST-HMG family, outside these regions, it's outrageously different among the genes in, in comparison to species. All you have to do to keep an HMG happy is keep this DNA binding domain on the N and the C terminus, just keep it positively charged and kind of alpha helical, and you're fine. So I think all these proteins need to do is get into the nucleus and bind DNA. So what we found out is that there are multiple uh, members, sometimes lots of amplification. If you look across species, here's what you find. There's sub, there, some of them are newly ar um, arisen, some of them are subject to loss during certain le or amplification. So they're kind of going crazy in Drosophilids. They differ from HMGs in that they are smart, shortly small, slightly smaller, and they're missing a, a, a critical proline as compared to the standard HMG proteins. So we've looked at some of these proteins when they come on and when they come off, and you can see when you transform the haploid sperm nucleus from this nice round, it's round, and then it gets spindly, and then it makes this canoe and the rock, and finally the needle is what we call them. During this process, they lose histones, this is acetylate histones, and they gain these sperm-specific chromosomal proteins. And if we label the members of the MST HMG class, we can see this is what the 10th one does, this is what another one does, so they have different profiles. And they even have, it turns out, different localization within the spermatid nucleus. So there's a lot of diversification. And we can make a table like this that shows during these stages, histones are coming off, acetylation's coming on and then off, these transition proteins are coming on and then off, and then these go to the telomere, these go adjacent to the nuclear pores, and then they move, and this one stays put. So there's a lot of dynamic behavior going on in different members of these MST-HMG classes. So this is our, these are our conclusions that we were quite surprised at. This, I, I sort of sympathized with, um, Barry, because I always want my students to do forward genetics, and then they get this bright idea they're going to go do reverse genetics, and I go, oh, then they get a gene family that's repeated, you know, and I go, I told you you should have done forward genetics, <laughs> but what can you do? 
So now we're doing, any, anybody else had that experience? So, so the HMG Vox family is an evolutionarily distinct group from SMPs compared to the H1 derived proteomines. Flies and many insects do not have H1 derived SMBP. So however the mammalian lineage decided to solve that problem, these, most of these dipterans don't do it that way. Instead, we think that these took advantage of spermiogenesis, amplified the family, diversified it, and these now show spatially and temporally distinct behaviors. It consists of functionally diverse group, as far as we know, or the ones that we knock out and get a phenotype. Some of them we have to knock out three or four of them. This one, as I just told you, is required to protect the telomere capping complex from loss during nuclear transformation and spermiogenesis. These two, actually this one used to be called Drosophila protamine, but we're waging a campaign to like rename it. I mean, it's not very exciting, this name, but Flybase wants us to name it this. So, so we have the redundancy problem here, but if we knock these three out, we find out it does not affect nuclear condensation, but affects individualization and release from the um, spermatid cyst. So they have very different roles, and we're proposing that these are really nice opportunistic kind of proteins. They have a DNA binding domain. It gets them into the nucleus, and then they're evolving rapidly and have different functions during spermiogenesis. Okay? Okay, so the only last thing I want to just mention to you is one of the advantages of being associated with the genome science department is we started thinking, oh, maybe instead of even do more genetics and reverse <laughs> genetics, we should do proteomics. So we did that, and Takua worked really hard and actually managed to isolate the sperm nucleus away from that outra outrageously long tail. And with the help of Jen Mary Hugh and Mike McCoss, we've done proteomics, and we've actually been do doing what we call the sperm head-enriched proteome so we can figure out what else is in that nucleus, what's in the centriole, what's in the plasma membrane would be, would be the ideal. And we're even picking up some proteins we know are exceedingly rare in these, so we have a lot to do on there, but we're getting a list of proteins, and we'll compare them to the ones that have been done for humans and mouse and ask how diverse are these proteins that are, um, are in the sperm nucleus in these different animals, even though morphologically they look the same. So that's kind of where we're at on that. So I want to end by just um, emphasizing how privileged I feel to be sort of in this network of geneticists and people. Certainly my association with Larry and with John and with um, Glenn has changed the direction of our research and we continue to pursue these things. So I want to thank Celeste and Leo for organizing this symposium. I know it was a lot of work. Uh, they're, they're not going to tell you how much work it is, but I know it was because I've seen them looking really tired lately. So I want to really thank, him for thank you for putting this together and giving us a chance to celebrate Larry and to introduce him to those that you don't know him, that don't know. But uh, also a big thanks to Iris. Um, Iris has taught me a whole lot of, of stuff about the history of genetics. She always gives me 600 books to read. <laughs> Then I go and read them and I go, oh, Iris, that's really good. And sometimes she'll say, oh, yeah, I never finished that. That one was kind of boring. <laughs> we, always, we love to go to bookstores. And she's given me a glimpse, as did Dan did, into some of this rich history of the department and how Larry contributes, as has Sergio Pimpinelli. Um, and Charles and Stan, I don't know if Stan left. Um, thanks for always being there, because if I need a genetics fix, Stan, I can always go to Charles and Stan and get that, and to John and, and uh, Glenn, who are my adoptees. And again, I want to just thank the Department of Genome Science. It's a fabulous department, and I just feel really privileged to be associated with um, this group. So thank you.